Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Regina Birkeke. I'm the chairperson of the AAPC Working Group Catheter Intervention, and I would like to welcome you to the AAPC YouTube channel. And I'm also here to present uh, to you an initiative of the junior members of the working groups re represented by Domenico Sirico, whom you will see later. We are sharing educational videos in the time of the pandemics and maybe later on as well. As you all might agree, um, Cassid uh, interventionalists are craftsmen or craftswomen. So we decided to use a master and apprentice approach. Today, our master is Mahmoud Al Sufi from Children's Specialty Hospital Al Jalila in Dubai. And our apprentice is Enrico Piccinelli, pediatric registrar at the Royal Brompton Hospital. The lecture will be on ASD closure. And uh, finally, I would, to like, uh, I would like to thank Linda Boschus from Canis, who helped us a lot with organizing and recording this video. The floor is yours, Mahmoud. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mahmoud Al Sufi. I am consultant pediatric cardiologist and the head of uh, Heart Center of Excellence in Al Jalila Children's Specialty Hospital, Dubai, UAE. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you today to discuss one of the very interesting topic in uh, pediatric cardiology intervention which is uh, atrial septal defect device closure step by step. Uh, first of all, I have nothing to, uh, to disclose. And uh, this uh, presentation will focus mainly about the headlines, how to select your patient, uh, how to pre prepare yourself in the cath lab before the procedure, how to do the procedure safely, how to overcome some uh, difficult cases and how to deal with them successfully. And uh, by the end, how to follow those patients after doing the successful procedure. Uh, let me start with uh, this slide, yes. Here. So as you know, the atrial septal defect is one of the commonest uh, asianotic congenital heart disease. It comes in five to 10% of all congenital heart disease, more in female than male. Either uh, it will be an isolated defect or part of uh, multi-congenital heart uh, defects. Uh, so uh, there is different types of ASD, ASD secundum, which is localized at the center of the atrial septum, as you can see from this diagram. And uh, uh, our topic will focus mainly how to close those types of uh, ASD. In spite of there is other types like sinus venosis superior type and sinus venosis inferior type ASD. Uh, there is uh, nowadays a special advanced technique for selected cases, how to, uh, to close uh, SVC sinus venosis uh, uh, ASD in the cath lab, but it will be out of uh, discussion for this uh, topic today. And there is, uh, uh, as you know, septum primum secundum. ASD usually, uh, it's different from foramen ovale. ASD, we have a real defect. We have a deficient septum, while in foramen ovale, we have uh, the persistent opening of the uh, fetal communication, let us say, between the left atrium and the right atrium, which is, um, in most of the cases, a benign phenomenon. Uh, back to the embryological uh, period, as you know, we, we had before a common atrium, then it will be septated by septum primum, the blue one, uh, coming down to, to fuse in the uh, cushion of the, in the cardiac cushion. Then the septum secundum, the green one, comes uh, laterally uh, on the right side. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it looks like, like a curtain and uh, it 
leave some uh, communication between the right atrium and left atrium to allow some communication during fetal period through the foramen ovale. So uh, the foramen ovale is the fetal communication between right atrium and left atrium, while the ASD we have deficient septum, especially septum secundum, and there is a real defect between a real defect in the atrial septum and real communication between the two atriums. And this is a specimen showing how there is a, a, an anatomical, let us say, hole uh, in the atrial septum. So having this hole or communication between the two atriums, it allows the blood to come from left atrium to right atrium. And this will add more vo volume overload on the right side, as you can see from this diagram. Also, there are, those are the different types of uh, atrial septal defect. Um, just to uh, simplify, let us say, the pathophysiology, there is more arrows on the right side, as you can see, right atrium, right ventricle, and pulmonary arteries, comparing to the right atrium, com com sorry, comparing to the left side of the heart. So this is a defect here. This is a shunt. This is a dilated uh, right atrium, then dilated right ventricle, then the dilated pulmonary artery. And this is the main pathophysiology in atrial septal defect, as you know. So there is volume overload on the right side. This load depends on the size of the defect. So the bigger defect, more volume overload and vice versa. Usually the left side uh, will be normal in most of those cases. Uh, when to close uh, atrial septal defect uh, in the cath lab. So according to the American Heart Association guidelines, uh, the ASD secundum can be or should be closed if there is a hemodynamic or symptomatic significancy, like a significant shunt QPQS more than 1.5 to 1, we have to close uh, those ASDs. If there is by echocardiography signs of right ventricle or right heart volume overload, as we discussed earlier. If uh, there is history of paradoxical embolization, in spite of the ASD size looks small and there is no signs of volume overload, but there is a, a complication of paradoxical uh, uh, embolization like TIA, pulmonary embolism, stroke, so we have to close uh, those ASDs. But we have to remember that a uh, patient who has ASD with as a, uh, anomalous pulmonary venous drain, so shouldn't be closed by device. Patient who has sinus venosis, in general, I'm talking, as I mentioned, sometimes we have selected cases which can be uh, nowadays closed by uh, in the cath lab. So septum primum defect, sinus venosis defect, those are a surgical cases. If we have deficient rims, uh, we'll discuss later how to evaluate uh, rims around the ASD. If the patient has deficient rims, especially posterior, inferior, or superior rims, those should be avoided. Uh, the uh, deficient aortic rim, usually it's not an absolute contraindication because we have a special technique to overcome such uh, uh, deficiencies. Uh, then if the patient has associated cardiac anomalies, which require surgical repair like TOF plus ASD or TGA plus ASD, uh, those who has irreversible advanced increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance like uh, BVR more than eight wood unit shouldn't be closed if there is signs of acute sepsis and those who has a, an absolute contraindication to receive anticoagulation therapy or antiplatelet treatment after uh, uh, device closure shouldn't, should be excluded from our list because uh, we have to keep uh, all patients after ASD device closure on anticoagulation therapy. Um, Pre-cath, we have to, first of all, select our patient properly. So this is the first step to have a successful case uh, by the end. How to select your patient? You have to do full study by transthoracic echocardiography, uh, especially in those who have uh, thin 
chest wall and good resolution. Otherwise, we may ask for transesophageal echocardiography to have a full information about the location of the ASD. Is it secundum? Is it primum? Is it uh, anterior, posterior, like this? The size of the defect, is it small, moderate, big? The number of the defect, is it single defect or it's multifenestrated defect. This is very important. We have to evaluate the whole rims around the defect. As you can see from this diagram, this is a, uh, the ASD secundum, but we have to evaluate the aortic rim and the posterior rim. We have to evaluate the superior rim and inferior rim. We have to evaluate the AV valve rim and the superior uh, pulmonary uh, vein rim. So all those rims should be seen, should be evaluated to decide, yes, this is a suitable case for device closure, or it's a high risk for device closure, or it's totally contraindication for device closure. We have to uh, search for additional anomalies. So if there is any addition, additional anomalies, we have to be um, aware about that, especially if there is anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, and we have to estimate what is the pulmonary uh, pressure by the right ventricle systolic pressure uh, estimation. Routine pre-cath uh, lab, uh, this is a routine for any patient who, who, who will require uh, cardiac cath, like uh, complete uh, blood cell count, uh, CRP, just to rule out any acute infection, BT, BTT, urea, uh, creatinine, and serum electrolyte, hepatitis screening, and et cetera. So uh, usually we used to admit those patients one day before the procedure to be seen by the anesthesiologist uh, to, to do the lab test before the procedure. And uh, we have to take the consent either from the patient himself or herself or from the parents explaining what's the aim of this procedure, what are the steps of, of this procedure, what do we suspect after this procedure and what are the suspected complications and how we can overcome briefly those uh, complication uh, in, in your cath lab. And, and you have to answer all questions and you have to relieve the whole concern and uh, of, of the patient or of his or her parents. Fasting time depends on the type of anesthesia. Is it general? Is it... Uh, local anesthesia and depends of the age group also. So to start with, uh, on table, usually we start with uh, a transesophageal echocardiography, uh, zero degree. You, we can see the left atrium, right atrium, and this is a defect here. And this is a position of the uh, ultrasound beam, as you can see at zero degree, then we can move sometimes south posterior to see the coronary sinus here and to rule out any coronary sinus type also defect more anterior to see uh, that superior rim of uh, the defect. Uh, then we can move to the short axis between 40 to 60 degree to see the aortic rim here and posterior rim and this is the aortic valve tricuspid valve and this is a defect as you can see uh, clearly. This is a aortic rim, this is a posterior rim. By color Doppler also, we can estimate the shunt direction. Long axis by cable, 90 degree to 100, uh, 10, 120. This is superior vena cava, superior vena cava rim. This is inferior vena cava and IVC rim. Those are very important rims to be seen before taking the patient uh, for device seclusion. Yep. Uh, if you have advanced technology like 3D TOE. Also, it uh, can offer and provide a very, very beautiful 3D imaging like what we can see here. This is a defect from the right atrium view. This is a superior vena cava, and this is part of the inferior vena cava. So you can estimate also the rims around the defect. And uh, if I move, quickly, this is IVC, yeah, this is the anterior rim, this is uh, posterior rim, and sometimes we can move and rotate to see the defect from the left atrium view. This will give you 
a full imaging, 3D imaging about the defect itself, then you will be more comfortable to select the device and to, uh, to observe your procedure uh, properly. In the cath lab, now you decided to uh, take this patient and uh, do device closure. You have to be sure and prepare that all equipments, required equi equipments are there on your shelf. So all introducer sheath according to the body weight, the small for the small babies and the bigger for the bigger patient. Uh, diagnostic catheter like multi-purpose uh, catheters, sometimes jet can write catheters. Uh, multiple size and types of wires, trauma wire, exchange wire, uh, blood gas sampling to, 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 to do full hemodynamic study, QPQS, and the blood gas, uh, autosaturation, pressure lines to measure, to measure the pressure invasively, uh, sometimes angiogram set just to do uh, angiogram, you have to have full set of devices, different size of devices to, to avoid any surprise uh, during the procedure, either un underestimated or overestimated uh, devices. Uh, balloon sizing for selected cases, just to, uh, to have more information about the accurate size of the defect. Then we'll do right heart catheterization from the right femoral vein, most probably, and sometimes from the left, according to the axis, we'll go deep inside the right atrium, then we'll cross the defect toward the left atrium. We'll, we, we, we place the guide wire in left pulmonary veins, and we'll use this wire as a railway for the rest of the procedure full hemodynamic assessment, QPQS, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance. And we have to keep monitoring the ACT, the acute clotting time to keep it uh, around 200. And uh, just to be safe that there is no risk of thrombus formation. Then how to select the device? This is very important uh, issue. Um, so usually, after doing uh, transthoracic, transesophageal, intracardiac echocardiogram, and sizing balloon. So you, you have to select the device size one to two millimeter bigger than the biggest uh, ESD size. For example, if you estimated the size 10 millimeter, so you may go to 11 or maximum 12 millimeter uh, ASD size. And you have to prepare the delivery uh, system on table. I will show you in the coming slides, step in step, how we can do it. So then we, we have to be ready to deal with all complication or complications like embolization, arrhythmia, erosion, perforation, oversize, all of this. You have to, you have to be trained for that, or you have to have uh, someone as assistant to who is expert to deal with those complications. And you have to have the equipments also like snares, uh, different size of delivery sheath uh, to, 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 to deal with such type of complications. Just uh, a quick review about the device. As you know, it's uh, an etinol uh, metal uh, device. This is a standard shape. It's self-expandable device. It has two discs, left disc, west, then right disc. It, it is attached through screw mechanism to the delivery cable. As you can see here, this is a screw attachment. This is a right disc here. This is a waist, which is equal to the size of the uh, defect. And this is a left disc. We have radio pick uh, hub here to help uh, knowing the position of the device. Self-expandable, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a polyester tissue, as you can see, uh, between uh, the metal mesh just to achieve complete occlusion after device deployment. We have different sizes from four millimeter till 40 millimeter. And uh, yeah, it's very soft device. And uh, yeah, those are the layers of uh, polyester tissue inside the uh, netinol uh, mesh. Sometimes we have special form. I will 
talk about that later on. Uh, how to evaluate the ASD size by TOE, transthoracic, intracardiac, or sometimes we'll uh, use sizing balloon. Sizing balloon, briefly, we can uh, place a balloon over the guide wire, which was already placed in one of the pulmonary vein. Then uh, you can inflate this balloon. We have different sizes uh, from sizing balloon. Then either to use a stop flow technique or a waste technique, then you can estimate what's the uh, accurate size of the defect, then select a suitable device. Uh, okay, then we decided which device to be uh, used. Then we have to prepare the delivery system. Delivery system usually consists of uh, four components, the, the dilator, the delivery sheath, the cable, and we have the bleed back set with loader. So this is uh, how to flush the all catheters by hebronized saline to prevent any uh, air uh, bubble uh, or air embolization. This is a dilator inside the delivery sheath and attached together by screw mechanism here. So the guide wire already there in the pulmonary vein and we can push the delivery catheter over the wire to, to be in the left atrium. And then we uh, will select the device and load it uh, in the next step. Then this is the loader. Also, we, it should be flushed by hebronide saline, no air bubbles. This is a bleed back set attached to the loader, flushed again forward, and sometimes we can flush backward to de-air that part from the loader. This is a, a delivery cable. Uh, also should be inserted through the loader. Then we have to load the device, as you can see from here by count by, uh, sorry, clockwise mechanism. And by the end, you can feel like a click and here click also as a sign uh, marker uh, that the device was loaded properly. Then you can test by pulling and pushing that the device is attached. MRS this uh, device and do gentle massage to de-air any hidden bubbles between the device disc under hebronide saline, then push the device to be uh, loaded in, inside the loader, then attach the loader to the delivery system. Uh, sometimes you, you may also flush the loader before attaching the loader to delivery system to be sure that there is no hidden air bubbles there. Uh, then uh, by gentle push, uh, you can push the cable and this will advance the, the, the device as you can see here and push it inside the delivery system and the delivery system already parked in the cavity of the left atrium. Then if you reach there under the guidance of fluoroscopy, just unsheath the left disc and you can see the left disc open it's clearly here. This is a left disc. This is a left atrium. This picture was taken from ice, intracardiac echo. Then pull the whole system toward the septum, open the waist, then open the right disc, and be sure. Yeah, this is how to open the waist, then the right disc. This is the right disc in the right, and this is a left disc in the left. Then you can do pull and push, pull and push, or Minnesota as you can see here, just to be sure that the device captured the septum properly and there is no uh, uncaptured rim and there is no risk of embolization. If you are unhappy about the position, you can recapture the device again, as you can see here, by pulling the cable inside the sheath and this will recapture the device and you can start the deployment again uh, in a new position. Uh, safely. Uh, 
sometimes if we have a crib reform, sorry, if you have multifenestrated ASD like this picture, we may select a special form of the device, which is crib reform. The crib reform device simply it's a, uh, it's a, a device which has uh, two equal disc, the left disc equal to the right disc, and we have very small waist in between. It's around only four millim five millimeter. This waist should be centralized in the center uh, of those uh, defects, and the rest of the uh, defect will be closed by uh, the left disc and right disc. We have different sizes of crib reform device starting from 18 uh, until 40 millimeter. Gentle reminder that then the normal device, it has left disc, which is uh, uh, bigger, slightly bigger than the right disc, uh, which is uh, usually two millimeter in each side bigger. Uh, you can look for the catalog at uh, different from company to another, uh, but in general, the left disc will be slightly bigger than the right disc. Uh, while in crib reform, we have equal uh, disc in left and right because we we will depend on the center uh, defect to be uh, to be uh, uh, closed by the uh, the waist and the rest of the. Uh, the holes will be closed by the left and right disc. After uh, putting the device in place and before release, we have to be sure that the left disc in the left, right disc in the right, the septum was sandwiched very well in between. Uh, we have to be sure about the adjacent structure, like there is no mitral uh, regerge and no tricuspid valve regerge. That means the disc and left and right did not interfere with the adjacent structure. Of course, we can reevaluate the aorta from different angulation. We have to see how is the flow across the pulmonary veins that we are did not uh, obstruct any flow across the pulmonary veins. Since everything looks reassuring, then you can unscrew the device and release it by counterclockwise uh, uh, rotation and uh, the device will be released uh, safely. Uh, if your cath lab uh, uh, was provided by intracardiac echocardiography, this also an advanced technology uh, to, to observe the procedure without general anesthesia because no need for intubation and uh, uh, this this one only require an another venous axis from the left side. Then you can insert the uh, the the special sheath and special prop inside the heart. Of course, in selected cases, and also you can evaluate the rims, the size of the defect. Uh, one point you have to remember that we are uh, here. Uh, opposite to the transesophageal echo. This is the right atrium and this is the left atrium because the prop in the right atrium here. And uh, yes, the whole rims will be evaluated. This is very important uh, and advanced technology in those patients who cannot tolerate, let us say, the general anesthesia for whatever the reason. The resolution is, is very, very beautiful. So you can evaluate uh, everything as we uh, described uh, earlier. Uh, the procedure usually will be done under general anesthesia for uh, transesophageal echocardiogram under sedation and local anesthesia if we want to do uh, intracardiac echocardiography and sometimes in small babies with very clear chest window we can do it under trans uh, thoracic guidance. Device deployment, again, uh, this is uh, another cartoon and uh, clip showing opening the left disc, then opening the right disc, then unscrew the device and release it in place. Okay, moving to the next slide. Challenging cases. This is very important uh, subject, actually. Uh, the life 
is not always easy. So we have sometimes uh, uh, challenging cases, especially the uh, especially those who 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 has uh, deficient rims. So um, yes, we can help them sometimes if we knew uh, special techniques like uh, lift atrium roof technique. That means we have, we have, if you remember, to close a big defect, that means you have to use a big device. Big device, the left disc is bigger than the right disc. Uh, the, uh, you should have a big lift atrium which can accommodate the lift disc uh, to, to, to prevent any dislodgement from the lift atrium to right atrium. That means sometimes if you open the lift disc immediately in a small LA size, this uh, disc will dislodge and move through the defect itself toward the uh, right atrium. So how you can avoid such, uh, 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 let us say, difficult, uh, difficult step, you can open the lift disc fully at the roof of the lift atrium, as you can see here, and uh, keep it there up, then keep tracking, keep pushing, keep some pressure on the lift disc there, then rapidly open the the rest of the device. So as you can see here, so while you are pushing the cable to keep the lift disc at the roof of the lift atrium, peel away the uh, sheath, the delivery sheath. These will reopen the waist and the right disc. Then the right disc will jump over to capture the left disc and to prevent this disc from the dislodgement to the right. So we can show you here how you can do it. So this is a left disc and pulled immediately. Uh, yes, this is a left disc, as you can see in the left atrium, keep pushing up then open the rest of the device quickly and this will, yeah, this one. This will capture the device in the right place. Sometimes we can use uh, one of the pulmonary veins uh, to deploy partially the left disc there, keep it partially collapsed there. Then again, quick pulling and uh, unsheathing of the device. This will prevent the left disc or the big left disc from the dislodgement toward the right atrium. So you will place the delivery sheath here, open partially the left disc and pull or unsheath the uh, delivery sheath. Then out of sudden, the whole device will jump over the septum. And you can see this again in this example. So this is a left upper pulmonary vein technique. And I will show you. This is right upper pulmonary vein technique. As you can see, the, this is a left. So the, the disc is still collapsed. The left disc partially collapsed inside the left pulmonary vein. This is uh, the proximal part of the left disc. This is the rest of the device, so keep it there, then pull quickly the delivery system and the device will jump over the septum. Balloon assistant technique, also sometimes we can use either the uh, sizing balloon or another balloon just to push the left disc inside the left atrium and prevent the prolapsing of left disc to the right atrium. And uh, then if you, you are done uh, and you open the right disc on the right atrium, try to deflate uh, this balloon and the left disc will jump and come over the right disc uh, without any dislodgement. Uh, snare technique, especially if you are afraid from the device dislodgement after release, what you can do, you can use corner extent to capture the hub of the screw and keep it there. 
uh, you can release the device, especially in those uh, device who, who, who have like a stiff cable. So the final shape of the device will not be able to evaluate it unless you will release the tension from the delivery cable. So if you release the cable, but still you have uh, a mechanism to catch uh, the screw and the device will be under control. If you notice that, see here the device is unscrewed, but the, still it was captured by uh, a snare. If the position okay, reassuring, then release the snare and release a device. We have different types of devices, starting from double patch, uh, double umbrella, uh, double disc. So, and nowadays we may ask for uh, a fenestrated device and those patient who has severe pulmonary hypertension and uh, you are afraid from sudden increase or uh, an RV pressure, so you may ask or you may create such type of uh, uh, fenestration uh, in selected cases. Um, there is helix uh, device, there is nowadays uh, bioabsorbable devices also with less metal tissue and uh, uh, yeah. that, so the future is promising for such type of devices. Um, Complications, we have to be ready, we have to be prepared, we have to be trained how to deal with complication, especially device impolization. So the device usually impolized due to undersized device, or if you deploy the device uh, and you did not capture the rims properly, either to the right side or to the left side. So you have to be uh, ready how to deal with. Uh, sometimes what, as you can see here, so the device dislodged to the left atrium. So first of all, you have to have different sizes of snare, then try to use bigger sheath than the delivery sheath. So try to go two millimeter up. For example, if you have used 10 millimeter delivery sheath, try it now to go to 12 millimeter to recapture the device in because this is not the standard mechanism to deploy the device. So you need a bigger uh, sheath to capture the device. This device was dislodged to the descending aorta, as you can see here. So from descending aorta, you can put a snare or everywhere and try to capture the hub or this, this area from this area, it depends on your luck and the device position. Sometimes you may uh, push the device to change the, uh, the angulation, then bullet inside the delivery sheath, uh, the bigger one, then either to go uh, with bigger uh, size, or if you notice that this is a surgical case, send this case for the surgeon. Another complications like perforation, erosion, especially in oversized uh, device, infection. So you have to keep uh, yourself, your items, all equipments in uh, well sterilized environment. Arrhythmias, uh, especially atrial arrhythmias and the thrombosis. Again, you have to check the uh, ACT frequently to keep it around 200 to prevent any thrombus formation. Uh, sometimes heart block, transient heart block, um, especially in oversized uh, uh, devices. And um, if you are lucky, uh, this will be transient and disappear. If not, that means you have to take this device out. And this is one of my case report about this complication. And how to follow those patients? Yes, you are done successfully. Then uh, you have to keep the patient under observation overnight, observe the vital signs, observe the groin area, if there is any bleeding, if there is any hematoma, and uh, keep the patient on antiplatelet uh, medication to prevent any thrombus formation and those patients should be kept on at least single antiplatelet for six months 
to allow the endothelial tissue to grow over the metal uh, uh, device. And after that, you can discontinue. Sometimes we have to give dual uh, antiplatelet. It depends on the uh, risk factors. Uh, discharge plan, that means you have to uh, explain to the parents or the patient when to come usually after one week, then one month, then three months, then six months, depends on your protocol. And when to come urgently, especially if the patient develop like severe and acute chest pain. And if you are aware or afraid about the risk of erosion, this is a very alarming sign. And follow up plan, as I mentioned, according to the protocol, one month, one week, one month, three months, six months, then maybe after that, either to discharge or keep following every one to two years. Uh, by this slide, uh, I came to the end of my presentation. I hope it was uh, clear, helpful, informative, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hear for your question and uh, discussion. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for your talk. I found it very uh, thoughtful and uh, very interesting and uh, clear. I I think you showed uh, uh, ASD closure uh, um, step by step as uh, uh, everyone would like to uh, to see and to know. And I think I'm sure that uh, this is not only my impression, but uh, uh, also um, uh, also everyone who's uh, who will watch uh, your talk will have the same feeling. Um, I would like uh, uh, to thank uh, Regina, Regina for, the, um, for chairing uh, this uh, project and all the interventional working group of the APC, which have endorsed the, this project. And uh, um, I think this is a very amazing project because it involves uh, a lot of junior members of the uh, APC. Uh, speaking of which, I would like to invite uh, all the juniors to uh, join uh, the group and uh, in doing so to contact me, uh, you can find my uh, contact details uh, uh, below in the video. Uh, finally, um, I would like uh, to thank also Enrico Piccinelli, which is the uh, junior uh, today, uh, which will uh, uh, ask you uh, some question is uh, not only a colleague but also a close friend of mine and uh, uh, we did our specialty training together so I hope uh, uh, you will uh, clarify our uh, uh, questions and so I um, don't want to waste any more time and I invite Enrico to uh, go on and uh, go ahead thank you Thank you very much, Domenico, for the nice introduction. And uh, also thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud and Regina. And uh, you, I also found uh, uh, this topic very interesting. And also this review is very comprehensive. Uh, and actually, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, just facing step by step uh, the ASD closure. So I think it's, it's uh, just amazing for all the junior members that uh, wants to approach this kind of procedure. So I have just a few questions for you, Dr. Mahmoud. If you Please don't mind, and yeah, yeah. Uh, just to clarify some of the doubts of mine, but I'm sure also some junior members. So first of all, the role of sizing balloon. I mean, I know that in many centers, uh, the, balloon, the balloon size uh, all the effect. I'm just wondering uh, also because my experience uh, at the Royal Brompton is a bit different. If you have some criteria when to size or not uh, uh, ESD, and also, what kind of balloon do you use? Often, uh, I'm sure you use the PTSX, but I'm wondering also what's the role, for example, of the equalizer balloon that we sometimes use when we have a very large uh, ASD with the deficient rims and the small left tail. I don't know if you have any experience with this or with any other balloon. That's my first question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for all of you for the nice organization. Um, regarding the sizing balloon, actually, 
it's it's like um, a personal decision uh, in general. Uh, it's not mandatory in all ASD to to use the sizing balloon. It's depend on the, the the operator decision. Some centers, as you mentioned, they used to use sizing balloon in all cases, and some centers in selected cases. Personally, I rarely use sizing balloon, but I do recommend to use sizing balloon in, in, in uh, certain circumstances or certain situation, like if you have large ASD and you are not sure about the actual size of the ASD. The rims are not clear by transesophageal echo or uh, intracardiac echocardiography. So you, you want to know more information about the actual size of the ASD. If sometimes also there is like a fragile rim and you don't know uh, if that rim will be supportive enough to hold the device in place, or you have to use bigger, let us say, device and uh, to, to, to be uh, stable uh, in situ. Uh, sometimes we do recommend to use sizing balloon in case you have multiple fenestrated ASD and you, you want to know uh, if the tissue between the two or three ASD is supportive enough to use two devices or it is very fragile so you can crush like a tongue tissue between the two or three holes and use one big device to cover the whole uh, ASD. Uh, those are the situation which I used to use a sizing balloon, as I told you. Now, which type of sizing balloon? Um, usually I used to use the Amplatzer sizing balloon. Equalizer balloon, it's smaller in general and rounded shape, yes. It will be more helpful if you have large ASD with a small left atrium, as usual. Uh, but personally, we don't have this uh, uh, balloon in our institute, so I, I have no experience with equalizer balloon. We used to use uh, the Amblatzer sizing balloon. As you know, there is different sizes, so you can use according to the uh, suspected size of your ASD. You have to be careful where to place the balloon. Uh, don't uh, uh, put it deeper uh, and not to damage the pulmonary vein. Sometimes if the balloon pushed deep inside that small left atrium or uh, the, the wire came down toward the mitral valve, so you have to be careful by TOE or intracardiac echo that you are away from the sensitive tissues. Um, which technique to use with sizing balloon? You, we used to use the stop flow technique. That means you will inflate gradually until you will seize the flow left to right shunt from uh, uh, the ASD or through the ASD. And this will be confirmed by transesophageal echocardiogram. Then you will try to take the, 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 uh, the waste and uh, select the device either equal or one to two millimeter bigger. Sometimes uh, some, some uh, expert people, they used to use the, like a waste technique. That means since you get a waste and you, you can, okay, uh, select the device according to that number. Yes. So thank, oh, thank you clear. very much. Yes, I think you answered uh, all my questions. Very clear, thank you so much. So uh, now the second question, you mentioned uh, also now some techniques that can be used in uh, challenging uh, ASD closure, uh, like yeah. the balloon assisted technique or the upper pulmonary vein technique. So uh, I have two questions regarding this topic. Uh, one is what kind of balloon and what kind of device you use for the balloon assisted technique, considering of course that there are some uh, devices that are softer than other. And so, uh, let's say an amplatzer is preferred than an occluder, uh, an occlutec. And uh, the second question is regarding uh, also the choice of the device in case of the upper pulmonary vein or the left atrium roof technique. Uh, I mean, if you try again with softer device to avoid the traumatism of the pulmonary vein, let's say. Yeah, it's a very good question, actually. Of course, we do recommend to use the softer device, especially in small children. Uh, so in general, a clotic wire looks uh, softer than the amplatzer, especially in, in, in bigger 
sizes like 20 and above and above. Uh, the Amplatzer uh, device, especially 26 and above, looks slightly stiffer than other devices. Having the, the, the hub uh, or the knob in the lift disc, these make the, the device slightly stiffer than the, the device who doesn't have this uh, hub on the lift disc. That means the compliance of the, the, the disc will be uh, much better and uh, it's softer against the adjacent sensitive tissue. Um, this is a principle of, uh, shall we do, uh, do recommend softer device or stiff device, of course, especially if you want to, to oversize of, to, or to use big uh, device. Last, last week, for example, we, we had one child, 10 kilogram, he has around 18, 19 millimeter, uh, ASD uh, defect, which is really big for such a weight, for such a body weight. So we used one to one uh, device from Oclotech, looks soft and uh, aligned nicely without interfering with adjacent structure. The fear from the big device in small baby, especially in small left atrium, you have to remember that in large ASD you have big right atrium and small left atrium. And you have to remember also that the left disc is bigger than the right disc. So you have to have uh, enough room to accommodate the big left disc uh, in, in such a big device and a small child. So of course, softer device will be safer than stiffer device. The another brand also, uh, there is a lot of uh, brands in, in the market right now, so it depends on your experience. Uh, but in general, I can say the wire of Oclotec device is softer than other devices. Which balloon to use for balloon assist technique? Uh, again, you have to, to, to use, you can use either the sizing balloon, but you don't want to put the sizing balloon deep inside the left atrium uh, to leave a good space for the left disc to come closer to, to the intraatrial septum. And equalizer balloon or rounded shape balloon also it can be used uh, because the, the, the volume inside the left atrium would be less. So those are the two balloons which can be used for the balloon assist, assist technique. Um, in general, pulmonary vein technique will be very, very uh, helpful in and, and, and most of the uh, large ASDs with uh, deficient, especially uh, uh, aortic rim or superior rim. The technique, the principle of the technique, again, you have to remember to close a big ASD, you have to use a big device or a suitable device. You cannot undersize. Big device, that means big lift disc. Big lift disc, that means you have to, uh, to have big, big room inside the left atrium to accommodate that disc. Uh, and the principle of device occlusion, you have to open the left disc first. You cannot open the right disc first and then deploy the left disc. So uh, the difficulties will be if you open the left disc fully inside a small left atrium, most likely this disc will protrude crossing the uh, defect to, toward the right atrium. So the idea to open the left disc partial in one of the pulmonary veins, then quickly to open the west and the right atrium, so uh, right atrial disc, so the right atrial disc will support the slipping left disc and it will prevent the uh, dislodgement of left disc uh, toward the right atrium. Perfect. Thank you so much again. Uh, this is uh, very useful. And um, so you also partially answered my third question regarding the choice of the device, mentioning especially the difference in stiffness of the different devices. Uh, what do you think are other advantages or disadvantages of the, I mean, the co most common devices used? Uh, let's say we all know the difference in profile, for example, especially for uh, small devices. 
between, let's say, Amplatz and Oplutech, and then could be, of course, a matter of discussion, or also the different uh, connection of the delivery system uh, with the device, and all the advantages that uh, basically the ball mechanism can have on the screw mechanism, especially in difficult situation. I remember just one case that we did recently from the internal jugular vein, where the ball mechanism was actually very useful in closing the device from above. Um, any other circumstance that you would consider and you would prefer one device instead of another one? Uh, again, it's a good question. Uh, in general, there is no perfect device, as you know. So there is advantages and disadvantages for each brand. Uh, first of all, you have to use the device which are which 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 you are familiar with, and you are uh, uh, you have good experience how to deploy, how to load, how to uh, deal with the complication in case you got some complication with such a device, how to retrieve. So you you have to uh, use the device which is. You are expert in, 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 in the deployment, retrieval, and dealing with a complication. This is from the principle, first principle. Second, um, of course, again, software device will be preferable to avoid interfering with adjacent structure like mitral valve, tricuspid valve, conductive tissue. You have to remember sometimes if you oversize, you, you may damage the SA node or uh, the AV node and get some rhythm issue. Uh, uh, you have to, to use, of course, the, uh, or, or better to use the smaller delivery system, especially in uh, small babies. The difference between each brand sometimes 20 millimeter device can be deployed, for example, in seven or eight millimeter in one brand and nine or 10 millimeter. Uh, delivery uh, system in another brand. So, of course, better to use the smaller delivery system to respect and to protect the small vessels and small baby. Um, <clears throat> regarding the, the alignment technique or the alignment advantages, of course, it will be better to have as much as possible the final alignment of the right disc before release. Um, most of the devices which have like a screw technique before the final uh, deployment, the right disc will be under tension. So there is like a, the, 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 a, a pulling tension on the right disc. So you don't know exactly what is the final shape of the device. And the sudden jump, sometimes it may push the right the, the left disc uh, out and Rarely, it may dislodge the device from the uh, uh, suitable uh, position. So yes, there is now, even a blaster device, they have a new delivery cable, if you remember, with very soft tip to allow the right disc uh, uh, to align as, uh, uh, as uh, good as possible over the septum. The ball technique on Amblazza, or sorry, on uh, Fiojola uh, Glotec device also, it add more advantages to, uh, to give you uh, the best alignment before the final release. There is a new also delivery system from uh, LifeTech devices, which is a Chinese product. It's like there is zero tension. Even with ball, technique, which is better than fully old screw system, sometimes the, the, the alignment it will not be 100% or the final shape of the device before release. There is some tension. It will, it, it will give you some tension. Uh, what I noticed from my experience that uh, the new delivery system from LifeTech, it's like uh, there is a wire, like a safety wire, capturing the right disc with zero tension. So you can see the final shape of the device even before release. So, and the, the releasing mechanism, it's very easy. It's like, like, a, like a gun, just uh, put uh, uh, a button out and you will release the device. Uh, so yeah, this is what I can say about the uh, 
releasing mechanism, less tension will be better. Whatever you want to, to select, either the new delivery cable from Amblazza, the, uh, the, the pole uh, delivery system from Oculotech, or the new delivery system from Lifetech. Okay. Um, uh, of course, uh, sometimes, you, you, you know, you can do what we call it Minnesota or wiggling uh, technique before releasing the, uh, the device, especially if you have still wide space between the right disc and left disc, just to, to see the stability of the left disc that the rims uh, all captures and uh, capture and the left disc in, in the right position. So this is one of the also uh, useful technique which can be used before the final release. Okay, thank you very much. I suspect it's also useful to have a good echocardiographer in this situation. Uh, this is actually, uh, it's very important. Uh, you, you know, you as an interventionist, you will deploy right disc, uh, sorry, left disc, then you will ask the echocardiographer, oh, how is the position? How is that? Of course, you have to, to keep your eyes with him because you are the, the, the main operator and the, this, the decision is yours and the responsibility is yours by the end. But to have good eco, echocardiographer, it's, it's mandatory. Yeah, to see the whole rims. What I used to do sometimes in some uh, missions that I say when we visited some centers outside, uh, I, I used to do echo and the echo and the, uh, the procedure at the same time. I change the gloves, go to, to, to see the echo myself, uh, to, to be happy uh, before the final release. So please don't release the device if you are unhappy about the final position. You can repeat the deployment once, twice, three times, four times, until you will be happy, then release the device. Taking five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes longer, before the final release, it's much, much better having the uh, dislodged device than try to snare it and try to capture it and, you know. Yes, and if I can add something, I think sometimes it's useful also a bit of transthoracic echo, especially to see the IVC ring, because sometimes it's difficult to see on QE. Absolutely, think that you can help. absolutely, absolutely. Use whatever you want to use to be happy by the end before the final release. Yes, trans thoracic, trans esophageal, esophageal, if you have eyes also will be helpful. 3D, but you know, such type of advanced technology is not available in all, in all institutes. So yes, do whatever you want before the final release to be happy and to be on the safe side by the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, one question, you mentioned device embolization. I think this is another important topic. So yeah. when try to retrieve uh, percutaneous the, the device or when just send directly to the surgeon? Let's say when the device is trapped into the tricuspid valve. Is it uh, worth to send directly to the surgeon or uh, they will give you a chance to take it out at risk of damaging the tricuspid valve? Let's say. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question, actually. So uh, again, it's better not to have uh, the dis uh, dislodged device rather than having this complication in the cath lab. So again, I'm repeating myself, try to not release the device and, and, and until you are sure that you are in a good position. Of course, select a suitable device, do the suitable technique, take your time. This will minimize the risk of embolization. But by the end, of course, there is some complications which may happen here and there. Uh, first of all, you have to uh, relax and not to put yourself and the whole team under tension because since you, you became under tension and uh, start shouting here and there, the whole team will be under stress and you will lose the concentration. Uh, of course, try to uh, make the patient hemodynamically stable as much as you can. What, what does that mean? That means if the device, for example, dislodged to the right side and go to the pulmonary area and stuck at the pulmonary valve, try to manipulate and push the device away from the outflow or the inflow and try to avoid the obstruction of inflow and outflow tract. And this will, will give you more time to think what to do next. 
to, to have a patient hemodynamically uh, stable as much as you can. Of course, watch the ACT, give extra dose of uh, heparin because it will take longer time uh, trying to retrieve the device out. So when to retrieve the device, always there is a chance to, to, to take the device out. Uh, unless the device trapped somewhere. That means, as you mentioned, either in the mitral cordae or the tricuspid cordae, don't pull too much and don't cause uh, significant damage to, 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 to the heart. The surgeon can take the device easily uh, and close the ASD surgically. Uh, so, First of all, try to make the patient hemodynamically stable by pushing the device away from the inflow and the outflow. Uh, try to use, as I mentioned in my presentation, two French bigger delivery sheath to retrieve the device. This will, will allow you, of course, to, to pull the device easier. Uh, if the device is stuck in uh, let us say, very important tissue or very sensitive tissue, and you think that pulling the device or giving more manipulation, these will, will, will damage or will harm the, the heart, of course, ask the surgeon to take the patient out. Since you get this complication, you have to call the surgeon and tell him, listen, we have a dislodged device, please be ready. So the whole team will be around you and they will be ready, the OT will be ready. Take your time to trying to retrieve the device, but since you, you stuck some, somewhere here and there, or you notice that the patient hemodynamically became unstable, you cannot move the device uh, out of the inflow or out of flow, especially big devices sometimes it may stuck here and there, you have to send the patient for uh, search, uh, surgical removal. Open your ears, listen to others. Sometimes you are under tension. And again, try to be relaxed as much as you can, but we are a human being by the end. Yeah, uh, and we all think about the patient safety. So sometimes you, you may listen some advisement from the technologist, from the echocardiographer, from your colleague, so keep your eyes open to listen to some advice to do this technique or that technique. This will be also helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So very last question is a bit of a provocative question. So how large is too large? So oh. considering uh, that uh, ASD, uh, as we know, are often not round and we measure in different projection on QE, we can have the help of the 3D reconstruction that actually can uh, help us. But when you try to close it, or when, uh, what criteria, criteria do you use and you think maybe it's too big or uh, the, let's say the posterior, posterior inferior rim is so deficient and you cannot do it. Uh, so when you at least try or when you decide just to send to the surgeon? It's a very important question actually. Uh, so of course, again, to have a successful procedure, you have to have a supportive rims to keep the device in place. And the most important rims, as I mentioned, the posterior and inferior rim. So you have to have at least, uh, at least one of them and better to have both of them uh, in good diameter. If you have deficient posterior inferior rim, there is no way to keep the device in place, so send the patient for surgical closure. Of course, if there is like a, very close to SVC, similar to sinus venosis, either with or without anomalous pulmonary venous uh, drainage, send the patient for surgical repair. Uh, aortic rim, most of the time, is not uh, much important or important to, to have a 
good aortic rim because you can have a supported posterior rim so the device may hug the aorta anteriorly. This will be good enough to, to have a stable device in place. Uh, how big is big and how small is small? This is, <laughs> this is always a question actually with, with no clear definitive answer by the end. But in general, and I, I heard that from also other experts and I mentioned in my lecture, so if the defects more than one to one body weight by kilogram, it will be considered as a large defect. For example, the body weight 10 and the defect above 10. In general, it's, it's a big, but it doesn't mean that all big devices are unsuitable for device closure. So again, you have to, to consider the total length of the septum. Is there a sufficient left atrium to accommodate the device in place. We, we don't want to put very big device, then the, of course, any, any defects can, can be closed by huge device, but you, you don't want to put a huge device inside uh, the left atrium and the device will, will interfere with mitral uh, movement or obstruct the pulmonary veins. So you have to see, can I put a suitable device to keep the adjacent structure free and to be stable in place or not. There is another like criteria or recommendation if the device, what you want to use is, or the ratio between the device and the patient length, more than 1.8, it will be considered like a large defect. For example, the patient length around one meter and you want to put 20 millimeter D, uh, ASD device. This of course will be uh, very large, let us say. And some people mentioned that there is a risk of uh, either erosion or uh, AV block. So you have to, to be uh, careful about that. Uh, finally, if you think that it's safer to send this patient for surgical closure. Um, so don't be hesitant and, uh, and don't be uh, or, um, like, I want to do with whatever the result will be, no. So you have to be wise enough uh, to, to take the right decision and the ego should be away from your experience by the end. <clears throat> yes. yes, everything, let's say, uh, for the safeness of the patient. So th thank you, thank you very much. I think um, this has been very nice and comprehensive and very useful for all the young uh, interventionists. Thank you uh, for the nice organization. Uh, we, uh, we always learn from each other. We always uh, learn from our experience, from uh, <clears throat> what we have done in the future. And you remember, we, we, we learn from our complications or mistakes, it's much, much more than what we learn from our success. So if you get one complication in your life, you will, you will remember this complication forever. And you will review yourself why it happened with me and what should I do better to avoid such a complication. And this is, will be, I mean, very, uh, very, very helpful for all of us to continue our success uh, uh, life in the future. And of course, by the end, it's a, a teamwork. We have to uh, listen to each other. We, we have the same goal by the end, which is patient safety. Uh, so don't mute your uh, ears from uh, any recommendation. And this will be helpful for you and for your patient and for the future. Thank you all. Thank you.
And thank you, Mahmoud, Domenico, and Enrico for uh, this great teamwork. And you mentioned it, teamwork is what we need uh, in the CAS lab, and teamwork is what we need to um, teach uh, and learn from our experience. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.